All right, yeah. well, I'd, like, I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, our webinar today um, with uh, myself, Matt Tanner of Magic Minds and uh, Neil Calvert, uh, who is the CEO of Link, our partner that works with us around our insights solution. And today we're going to talk to you about the digital twin of your organisation and as we've said in our tagline, how you can become cool like NASA. Um, so as I said, I'm Nat. I've actually been working with the Magic Minds team for a couple of months now and actually aligning with Link. Um, long history in IT and Agile and all, all things about change inside an organisation, which aligns very nicely to uh, how we as an organisation operate and, and how Link aligns to that. Just a, a few quick housekeeping items. As I mentioned, this session will be recorded, so we are actually recording uh, right now. Uh, you can keep yourself on mute, um, and we will be having a Q&A at the end. If you look to the right-hand side um, of the taskbar in Zoom, you can actually pop questions in the chat there, in the, the, the chat toolbar at the bottom. And as we said, we will actually be going through those questions at the end for you. And without further ado, I'm now going to hand off to Neil Calvert, and Neil's going to take us through the conversation on the Digital Twin. Over to you, Neil. Hi, Nat, and everyone else. Thank you very much indeed. Um, really great pleasure to be here online with you today. Um, this is the first of what we hope is going to be a series of conversations about uh, Digital Twin in the organisation. So um, I've got more than 25 years of experience in the IT industry. Uh, really through the whole of my career working with information uh, initially in the geospatial industry, working out how people add location to their data and information in order to make it more valuable. Um, that was really one of the reasons that Link was formed more than four years ago was helping uh, a client that I was consulting with um, reconnect with the data that they knew or thought they, they needed in order to drive uh, um, value through their business. Uh, and Link um, ended up turning from a consultancy tool into a platform. Um, and we in Wellington uh, work on developing and um, uh, the platform and then selling it and helping our, our clients and customers realize value through these methodologies. Um, I live in Wellington in New Zealand. It's uh, just after midday here. So um, I know uh, we've got people from, from pretty much um, across the globe, actually. Uh, are joining today so you know where, whatever time of day it is thanks very much indeed for uh, getting in touch so um, I'm going to kick off slightly differently today uh, there is this concept I was introduced to by a, a friend of mine around a, a movie log line um, and it's a brief statement which uh, helps you understand what the movie is about these are actually things that were developed uh, by the industry uh, when the movie was pitched to producers um, so no no prizes here for guessing what the movie is um, that this logline is associated with. It's, of course, Jaws. Um, and the same is true for organisations. We can create um, these loglines, these single statements, which invoke imagery, I guess, in our heads um, around the, the, the technology that we're thinking about or the movie that, that we want to go and look at. So we've been contemplating this for Link, um, and I'm going to throw one up just as a a bit of a precursor um, to get you thinking, and then maybe at the end, as part of Q&A, uh, if you have some fantastic insight around what we do, maybe you can suggest alternates to the log line that we're creating. So our log line is uh, digital twins, current and future, help a business executive convinced that change is too risky to mobilize his team towards a more certain future, delivering huge customer value and saving their career. Um, bit bold and dramatic, but that's what these things are designed for. So uh, I really wanted to use this just to kind of contextualize um, what we're going to be talking about today, which is the power of this concept of digital twin to help organizations de-risk um, their thinking about the change and transformation that they, they want to undertake um, to align the whole organization in terms of everybody's working to, together towards a more certain future, especially given the climate that we all work in today, um, where the customer is front and center in our thinking, but also we are becoming heroes in our own organization. So that's really where this log line came from. And um, that segues very nicely into, you know, why do we need to think of, of technologies and of processes like Digital Twin uh, in our organizations today? And it's because the environment that we're operating in is, is um, changing so, so quickly uh, that we're all under pressure to respond. 
Um, not only do we just have more and more technology available to us, uh, there's a recognition that we are now operating in the in the digital economy. I guess it's the the next um, revolution. It's the digital revolution. We've been in it for a very long time, but we haven't necessarily woken up to the fact that this requires us to do things differently and to think differently. Um, we're all looking to reduce our operational cost and become operationally excellent. We have great pressure to consider the data and information that we hold about our customers and our staff. So there's a a human experience that we need to manage manage inside our organizations. Often there is regulation and legislation that drives us to do that. So general data protection regulation in, in Europe is having global impact on our um, how we think about our, our own data uh, and how we let other people use it. The customer's choice and expectation is growing all of the time. Uh, customers expect to be able to interact with us as organizations in the same way they interact with their own technology at home. So if they're managing their own lives online um, and they're able to go shopping online from their armchair, they expect a similar level of service from, from us, whatever it is uh, that we are delivering to them. At the same time, uh, we have no time to do anything new. So, and that includes innovation and curiosity. And curiosity is one of these really interesting human values, which doesn't necessarily feature on the corporate value statement. Um, but without curiosity, we don't have the time to poke our heads up, have a look around, understand what's going on and work out whether we're able to be different in our own marketplaces. And of course, um, governments all around the world are constantly updating their policies around things that we have to do. Um, and that also impacts uh, how we operate. And at the same time, there's a massive opportunity out there. Um, it is driven by technology, and these are some of the buzzwords uh, of the moment. Um, and it's not so much uh, are they available to me as an individual and, and an organization, it's are they relevant? And that um, I think the, the question that is often more important to ask and answer is which of these can I safely ignore? Uh, if you got involved with all of these technologies in your own organization, you'd be caught up in uh, an environment where you never really knew whether any of them were going to add value to, to your organization. So we have to understand whether these things become valuable to us in context um, based on what, what our businesses are trying to achieve as organizations. So what are our strategic aims as a business and do any of these things help? And, and that's really the, only the beginning of the conundrum that we face because uh, technology is easy to implement. Uh, the change that is associated with it um, in terms from the impact on people is significantly harder. And, and we know that uh, culture and human beings are the number one barrier to successful change inside organizations. So there is a, there's a massive opportunity out there, but we have to view it in context and we have to think very accurately about the impact of implementing any of this in our business. Um, and that's kind of summed up in two quotes that I found. The first, in the midst of chaos, there is also opportunity. Uh, Sun Tzu is the author of The Art of War. Um, I'm not suggesting that your organizations are all in chaos, but uh, I think it's a great thing to think about. Uh, and also Albert Einstein, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. Uh, and that's the challenge I think I lay down for you um, today. It's how do you enable yourself to think differently um, about the way that you operate as an organization and the opportunity out there to drive change? Um, how do you do it today? Are those processes, uh, are they, they sl uh, sleek, are they agile? Um, are the people open to change? Are they receptive to thinking about things differently? Have you got ideas about how you could uh, speed up your decision-making process? There was an article in The Economist a couple of weeks ago that said a fast decision is a good decision. Um, and they did a, a set of research across hundreds of organizations and, and the faster that a business was able to make a decision about something uh, it correlated to the success of that decision driving value inside the organization. So we need to accelerate um, how we're able to assess opportunity and then deliver it inside the organization. And the belief is that uh, this concept of the digital twin is something that we can take advantage of. Um, it's not necessarily a new concept. Um, I'm sure most of you have seen the movie Apollo 13. Uh, in that, their carbon scrubber, carbon dioxide scrubber failed um, after an electrical fault and fire um, in the space vehicle. And the uh, NASA teams on the ground 
all had exactly the same equipment across um, six replicas of the, the, the space vehicle. And those teams on Earth got um, themselves into the space vehicles, looked at all of the components that were available to them and managed to come up with a, an idea that was then replicated in space that saved those astronauts' lives. Um, that's the analog beginnings of what a digital twin enables organizations to do. Uh, that concept was taken by NASA. They build these digital models of their space vehicles because they're not able to be with them to monitor them and to manage them. So the digital representation of the space vehicle allowed them to put sensors on the physical twin and drive data to the digital twin, which responded in the same way so they could understand what was going on um, with the space vehicle, but they could also then send commands to manage it. Um, that concept then moved into the engineering world and you'll probably um, have seen models of uh, wind turbines and aircraft engines, which help um, those organizations predict when components might need replacing, um, look at data around efficiency and effectiveness and, and use that uh, content in order to drive future R&D. Um, this is now moving into the digital twin of an organization where we think about uh, the, the organization as an organism with uh, lots of people running around in it, doing lots of different work, making use of a whole ton of different systems and creating and using, relying on a, a vast amount of data and information. And, and so now we see organizations like Microsoft bringing uh, digital twin concepts across their entire platform uh, because they believe that this will be a technology that will be ubiquitous um, in the not too distant future. And so we want to be able to think about the, the smartest, uh, simplest, quickest way of being able to model our organization so that we can uh, really get a good view of how we're operating today and take advantage of that new knowledge in order to be able to simulate change, which uh, then helps us de-risk that change and also drive the measures that we uh, want, want to um, achieve in order to say that we've been successful with any of the change that we've done. Um, and this is where Link, our platform, comes in. Um, Link uh, models the relationship between uh, people, the work that they do, the systems that they use, and the data and information that they uh, rely on and create uh, as that content flows through the organization in order to deliver business value. Um, and uh, today we're really going to have a look at how we take the concept of digital twin of an organization and use a platform like Link in order to drive outcomes that uh, hopefully make our business um, relevant in the digital economy, but drive success for the future. And there's, there's lots of elements to a platform like Link um, because there are many things that uh, underlie successful change inside an organization that we we often ignore because we're caught in processes that we've been using for a very long time. And so um, we want to take organizations on a journey from the overall transformational aims of, of the business, which are aligned to their strategic objectives, through a set of um, modeling which builds us uh, a a view of our organization and we fully appreciate that uh, all models are wrong some are useful so we want to make the most useful model that we possibly can so that we can then do analysis against it which allows us to look at things like the human experience um, that the the business creates for staff and for customers and so thinking about customer journey mapping thinking about humanizing the data that we rely on in order to make the decisions that that we have to make to see the business uh, become and stay successful and then take that content, that new knowledge um, through a process where actions become prioritized, where we are doing things rather than talking about things. We're taking the entire organization on a, a journey that is aligned. So we're harmonizing the communication through the business, using storytelling, using scenarios that people can align themselves and, and connect with in order to then drive evidence based change. Um, become data driven as an organization and ultimately deliver successful digital transformation. And digital twins do all of this. Uh, they create an engagement right the way through the organization at the stakeholder level, but also um, with people who are going to have to be involved in implementation that is a result of, of, of understanding how the organization needs to change. But doing that with a full understanding of the implication of that change before we commit any resource, people, time or money to uh, doing the actual work on the ground. So let's get an understanding through the model 
that our change is going to be impactful, that we're going to create value, that uh, we understand the impact on people um, through an action plan which is data driven, it's data informed, where we aren't relying on um, assumptions, we aren't relying on hearsay or gut feel. We're not having to respond to the people who've been there the longest, who shout the loudest or paid the most. We can have an evidence-based uh, protocol behind us which which allows us to uh, think about the prioritization of these actions where the communication is is um, believed by everybody because we all understand what's being said so we want to take the technical jargon out of the communication to help decision makers break through uh, some of the decision paralysis that they end up in because they, they don't have access to content that they understand and we know that 87% of the ex executive inside organizations are not IT savvy. And yet we still uh, believe that we can, we can bamboozle them with lots of technology speak and great IT solutions and, and they'll just say yes because they, they want to believe us. Well, we, we want actually we, we get better decisions and faster decisions if we can communicate with them effectively. Um, using visualizations rather than words. We know that we're, as a species, we're very visual. And we've we've known for a long, long time that a picture paints a thousand words. Well, you know, a model might replace a million, um, a tome of, of paper uh, across several different outputs that we expect people to understand. So let's use visualization in order to help people understand. And let's bust silos. Let's think about the organization as a, a whole organism where we can cut across those silos. We can become cross organizational. We can understand the cause and effect of change in one area of our organization on others and thereby increase the value of the change that, that we're going to deliver. And so we see digital twin of the organization today um, really enabling four key uh, use cases. So the first one is really that um, this is how I operate today. So I can um, very quickly build my current state view. Then I can simulate the change that I want to enable inside the organization and I can implement uh, outcomes based on the value. Um, the second one is it, it um, helps us inform our information governance strategy. Uh, the, the element that is often missed in other modeling is data and information. We think about people, we think about technology, we think about processes, but the, the data and information aspect, the fourth pillar, is often overlooked in many of the architecture disciplines <clears throat> and even in business process modeling. And so if we can reconsider our relationship with that data and information, we can make much faster and better decisions about the opportunities that exist if we deploy that highly valuable asset more effectively inside the organization. And um, through that, we're going to enable data literacy. And uh, we are beginning to understand that data literacy is becoming a core competency to uh, be able to play in the digital economy. Um, we need everybody to understand the implication of data, not just our data scientists, um, not just our analytic experts, but everybody inside the organization needs to begin to understand how to think about the data that they use, that they create, that they access, that they store, that they would like um, in order to make their work more valuable. So we have to build this new vocabulary and understanding inside the organization. And the, the fourth um, case that we see often for Digital Twin is our ability to fundamentally change the way we build business cases, um, taking a value approach and disrupting the decision cycle. And we'll look at that in, a, in a, um, a few slides time. And Digital Twin kind of fits into a new paradigm that's, that's emerging uh, for organizations. And it's, it's this one of continuous next. Um, so this is a, uh, an evolution of continuous improvement. Uh, the word improvement apparently got um, several people agitated because it it uh, suggests that where you're moving from wasn't necessarily right um, and we we don't things don't need to be wrong for them to improve so continuous next really shifts that uh, paradigm to one where i am constantly having to evaluate where i am what i want to achieve and how i'm impacted by the environment that i operate within and digital twin is one of five of the primary pillars that we know about for continuous next the other four being augmented intelligence. Um, so rather than just artificial intelligence, this is the, the human and the machine working together where the machine does the things that we humans are not very good at. So the repetitive um, number crunching type of, uh, of work that we, we often see people doing where well, we get machines to do that. And then the human beings, we use our empathy and our experience um, in order to think about the impact of the work that the machine's done for our business. 
Uh, culture, which we mentioned, and culture hacking. How do we align the people inside the organization to make sure that change is relevant and successful? Uh, this move from um, project management to product management, and specifically digital product management, because whether we have accepted it yet or not, we're in the digital economy, we are creating digital product, even if it's just a representation of the physical things that we produce for people and sell, and um, be that a product or a service, there is a, uh, a digital representation of that which exists on our website, in our materials, and products need managing differently than, than projects. Um, they're often multidisciplinary, they cut across teams, um, they are uh, by very nature unsiloed uh, as, as outcomes, so we need to think differently. And of course, privacy being the fifth pillar here, privacy now being a, an ethical consideration for the buyer, um, they will begin to ask us if we have privacy policies about um, the private information that we share with them and, and how are they using that, so gaining consent for uh, taking our data and then using it for different purposes. Um, so these are the, the five early pillars um, of, of Continuous Next, Digital Twin just being one of them. So where do we start? Um, and this is, this is often the, the question that people struggle to, um, to think about. There is so much out there. Uh, there, is, there is so much opportunity. Our organizations are large and complex. Um, where do we start? And so um, the thing I'd like to uh, step back to is, well, we, if we agree that the old way of doing things inside our business in terms of enabling change uh, doesn't work, and we believe it doesn't, because um, if you think about this cycle here, it, it starts off with a current state uh, analysis of the organization, um, which it takes too, today it takes too long, so it gets overlooked. We, we don't bother with it. We jump to the exciting conversation about where do we want to move to, uh, what's the change that we're going to implement, what technology are we going to use. So, um, and we tend to be very technology focused about that conversation, so we always start with, with the systems. Um, and then we, we end up um, doing work around building the business case, and we might have several of these going on at the same time. There's, there's a lot of sunk cost in building a business case. They take a long time. Uh, we worked with an organization a couple of years ago. They said they had half a dozen business analysts working on building business case. It took them six months. And of course, they were very, very upset when they presented their findings to be told by the business that it was no longer relevant because they hadn't responded to the pace of change inside the organization or the environment around them. And they, they were head down doing the work. And uh, it, it was effectively um, hundreds of thousands of dollars of sunk costs that they were never able to recover. Um, but we, we insist on doing business cases in order to understand the return on investment. When we know all of those numbers, we then prioritize where we're going to invest and the work that we're going to do. And then we get on and do it. We do it with crossed fingers, crossed toes. Um, we don't necessarily manage scope very well. And scope creep is one of the biggest killers of successful projects. Um, and because we didn't do the current state, we can't really measure the results of our change because we didn't have the baseline. Uh, that we to, to start from where we could now assess where we were and agree or not whether we improve things and take those learnings and then apply them in a different way um, next time inside the organization. So we really want to break apart this old cycle. And the way that we think that we can do that is, well, let's assess the impact of investment before we make those huge investments and we throw money at problems. Let's engage our internal talent. Um, let's give them time to be curious, to innovate, to collaborate. Uh, let's have them understand the measures that define success, which we can do through building the digital twin. And then around that, we have to design new ways of working so that we can deliver programs of work across the organization that deliver results. Um, and we can really start taking the philosophies of Agile uh, within the organization and building teams that uh, accelerate to the, the point of decision very quickly and then get on and do things with a high degree of confidence um, that the change is going to be valuable to the organization. And if we do that, we effectively disrupt the, the decision cycle. Um, we, we know that there is value in building the current state. Um, so this is the digital twin of our organization today. We then want to assess the value of the work that we do in order to create the business value we require to be successful. And with that value lens, we can identify areas of the business that need to be invested in before others, which effectively stops us from creating 
half a dozen or more business cases across the organization, we might end up only having to build one um, in order to be able to communicate to the decision maker that, that there is value in, in enabling this change and making this investment. We can then very quickly move to get the work done. And when we do the work, as we're doing the work, we can measure the results of the change that we're initiating because we know where we're moving from. And this allows us to get into this continuous next loop because we can repeat the things that were successful. We can very quickly change approaches to things that were less successful. And so we need a model um, and a language to be able to do all of this. And that's what we have spent the last uh, four years doing in, inside Link um, to support the concept of digital twin of an organization. So uh, we take the perspective that an organization is actually a relationship just between four uh, base entities. Um, those are uh, people and the, the systems that they use, uh, it, the work that gets done, actions, and the data and information that gets uh, created, which supports the work that we have to do, but also is created as a result of the work. And so we see two aspects inside an organization, um, the bit that we call the information flow, which is the fuel for the business. How does the data uh, flow through our organization, enabling the work to be done that creates more and more content until ultimately we're, we're creating this information asset, uh, which is a, a digital entity in its own right that allows us to deliver against the business outcome. And then the enablers of that flow inside the organization are people and systems. So people perform actions using a system, uh, systems supply information and systems can automate actions and with this very simple language and these four entities we are able to model any type of organization at any level of digitalization and we specifically talk about systems rather than technology because uh, often we go into an organization and we start helping them understand how they operate today and we find lots of paper um, lots of conversations going on where there is not a system of record um, the content is not digital from birth and a lot of the actions that take place are converting um, paper content or files into more authoritative content that can be shared in order to enable the business. So um, this, this is the makeup of, of uh, the models that get built, which represent the digital twin of your business. Um, it's a simple language, but it affects a huge amount of insight because we can now start asking questions across those four entities. Uh, we can ask, which systems are of value in enabling us to deliver the outcomes that we require for our organization. We could pivot around the people doing the work and the systems that they use. So now we can value people as part of our processes uh, in order to deliver the outcomes that we need to be successful. We can understand the cost of producing the outcomes that we rely on because we understand the cost of systems and people and we know how long work takes. So we're able to take that very simple language and and then pivot around the, this content in order to deliver these outcomes, these, in, these insights very, very quickly, which make the digital twin meaningful and, and uh, facilitate the conversations that we need to have through the organization. Um, the results are, are quite significant. Um, this is a quote from one of our recent customers. Within a day and a half, we, we had the, um, the understanding that we needed to improve our customer experience. Um, so it can be a very, very quick experience. Um, and what I'd like to do now is a very uh, quick demo, just showing you some um, outputs from Link and uh, how we go about the digital twin process. So we'll just flick across here. So um, this is Link. Uh, it is a, a software as a service platform. It's hosted in uh, Amazon AWS. So there's no install. Um, it's been built in order to help facilitate the very quick capture of the models that represent how our organizations work. Um, there are some key aspects to Link that make it different from other things that we do. The first is we want to consider value um, as a lens in the organization very early on in our models. So we have a value uh, methodology that we um, use inside an organization to help them consider what value means for them. And we want to move that away from a financial conversation. So we talk about risk if assets are not available. We talk about the uniqueness of content that's created inside the organization that provides a competitive advantage. We talk about the number of processes and people that are supported by content that's created. And that allows us to score the information assets that we create uh, within our business that allow us to deliver a business outcome. So this example is from a utility. Uh, this utility um, was very interested in the, the cost to create a QA design 
uh, for infrastructure build um, when they respond to their, their customers' request for new service. And they've scored that 10 out of 10. Um, as part of this process, they also began to understand there's a huge amount of work done in their asset management system, and they produce a lot of paper maps uh, through, through the work that's done. So this score gets two out of 10. And what Link does with this model is it begins to aggregate value based on the reuse of uh, information and work um, done through the organization. So as we roll down the sketch, you can see that this, the 12 and the 10 here for these two pieces of information become a score of 22. Um, this flows into a score of 32 because we've given the, the tracked mapping work record a 10 out of 10 in its own right. So the value has increased here. We can see the design that gets built has a value of 62. And this is because it now enables these four different flows through the organization. Uh, we can come right the way down here to see the capacity plan has a score of 80. Um, and we'll finally get down to the beginning of our flow, which is the customer account creation has a score of 90. So now we can begin to assess areas of our organization based on the value that is created by the people, the systems, the information and the actions that take place. And we can then drive in, dig into our business in order to understand the detail around what goes on. So at the beginning of this organization, this is how a customer request is created. And this is where the model um, comes alive. So you can see here is the customer and they're performing an action. There are three channels for this organization to create the service request. The customer can send an email, can send a paper request and can send a fax. And this is the information that's created as a result, the email, the paper request and the fax. And then the engineer sits inside the asset management system and they manually create a service request. This costs the business $128,000 a year. And we know that because the engineer carries a cost of $70 an hour and the action that they perform takes them 20 minutes and they do five and a half thousand of these a year. The output from this action creating the service request is we end up with a service request inside the asset management system. We end up with a piece of location information and up here we have an address. And the service request then enables the engineer and the customer liaison to review and validate the request with the customer. And this costs the business an extra $165,000 a year. So before we even have a validated service request, this organization has spent nearly $300,000 doing manual work in order to get to the point they know what the customer is asking them for. And then this validated service request flows through the rest of the organization and we end up being able to see other aspects of the work that needs to be done inside the organization. Now we could sit inside this sketch for a very long time, we could be identifying things where we could automate um, actions that take place through the business. But actually what we want to do is move away from that very quickly and start thinking about uh, delivering insights that we can communicate to people inside the business. And this is what happens in the background. We end up with uh, insights that allow us to understand the full cost of delivering work inside the organization. Uh, for this part of the, the business process that we've modeled, the amount of time that it takes in to do that, the level of automation that we achieve. So here we can see there is no automation inside this part of the organization, which means it's a highly manual business with 14 unique people, teams and roles using 11 unique systems in order to do their work. Uh, we might um, then go and have a look at systems and begin to understand which of those we are using and how important they are to our business. So this is a scale of the number of outcomes supported by the value. And if we look quickly down this list, we can see things like a printer, the phone, even inter-office delivery. So moving paper around in envelopes and trolleys are important to this organization. Now we can assess the impact of that to the business. So if we pick inter-office delivery for this organization, we can see that 63% of information flowing through the business in order to deliver those business outcomes is reliant on content that flows through inter-office delivery. Uh, 1,600 hours and nearly $120,000 worth of cost associated with that. And there are four people who rely on this to do their work, and here they are. So we can now begin to see what's going on inside the organization. Uh, we might then look at the cost of enabling uh, the outputs. So we can see we're spending $2 million on printed maps we're spending $1.1 million on the QA design. We're spending one and a quarter million dollars on updating the asset management system. And we might want to now assess the impact of things that we could do differently. So as I'm modeling my current state, I've been 
tagging nodes which could be automated so these are actions work that's currently done manually and if we select those tags inside the organization you, i can see through automation i can immediately impact six million dollars worth of cost inside the organization and seventy nine thousand hours of time and that's just a rough order of magnitude view of if i got rid of manual work that was being done this this would be the impact and what this allows us to do is to start thinking about what my organization could be so if i was to remove all of the cost uh, all of this waste inside the organization remove all of this manual work automate it however i might do that that could be uh, through implementing robotic process automation it could be by putting some technology in place it might be by just thinking about the processes that people undertake or even reassigning the type of work that people have to do i'm very quickly able to build a future state so this future state model follows exactly the same language and we're able to now see the impact of that by using the insights so if we quickly just run through these we can see that in our future we could reduce our operating costs from over six million dollars to 1.69 million dollars and we could reduce our uh, annual time from nearly 100,000 hours to 37 and a half thousand hours and we can increase our automation by uh, up to 45 percent um, and we can see the direct impact that this has so we might go and look at uh, the impact assessment and then um, pick uh, a, a person or think about the tag um, of things that we've actually automated inside the organization um, how we deal with high risk elements within, within the business so we can now start to build a view which helps our decision makers understand what um, they can expect as an outcome from the investment that they're going to make. Uh, and in this case, we've reduced the QA design down to just over a quarter of a million dollars from $1.1 million. And this was the key driver for this organization. And we've done that by taking paper out of the business, which we can see multiple copies of the maps has dropped from nearly $2 million to just $50,000 a year. Um, this becomes uh, very clear to the decision maker if we just simply compare our current state with our future state. Uh, so we pick our um, current state sketch, which is how we oper operate today. We pick a future state sketch of where we would like to get to. So remember, these are just um, digital representations of our organization. And if we compare those, we can very quickly see we could say $5.19 million and 57,000 hours. We can see the people who are impacted by the change. So we now know who we have to go and talk to about um, their role and uh, all the change in the work that they're going to have to do. And we can also see the systems that we are no longer going to um, use inside the organization. So this, this process becomes very, very quick. Um, we're talking weeks of work rather than months. Um, and, and ultimately, we just build confidence inside the organization that the change that we're suggesting is going to be valuable to the organization. So um, how can you get started? Well, rather than thinking about the whole of your organization, um, let's use the analogy of how do we eat an elephant? Well, we eat an elephant a teaspoon full at a time, and the same is true for your organization. You can get started by considering one line of business or process that's causing you pain. Um, if we did a poll, of the people on the on the webinar and listening to this webinar, uh, I, I expect that every single one of you would have some idea of parts of the organization that um, could be better, could be more efficient, more effective, uh, where there was an opportunity to think about new ways of doing the work in order to, uh, to be more successful. That's where we start. Um, and you should consider how to build a digital twin of your organization. And of course, you can use link to document and share that content digitally through your organization. If you'd like to know more, um, we are going to stay on this webinar uh, for five minutes or so at the end for Q&A, but um, you can also book time directly with me um, through Calendly, uh, the link on the screen there, um, and you can sign up for a 30-day free trial of link on the link website. And with that, um, we're going to pop into a, a quick q and um, I don't know whether uh, anyone's been putting um, comments into into the the chat, um, but also feel free to un unmute yourself if there are things that you'd specifically like to ask. Uh, we'll keep recording because the Q and A is often interesting for people. But um, other than that, thanks very much indeed for your time. Appreciate you staying on to listen. And uh, yeah, we'll do Q and A now. Nat, okay. back over to you.
Yeah, no worries. We've actually done any immediate questions. Oh, oh actually, I've just got one that popped up. Um, so Mark would like to know, would love to know what the ability to capture revenue as well as cost and value. Revenue as well as cost and value. So um, the rev revenue could sit as a custom property against the business outcome. Um, so if you have other systems inside the organization where you're able to define how much money is made um, by any of the business outcomes that you deliver to your customers. Uh, putting that into um, a custom property against outcome would allow you to then directly use the Excel export that Link has to um, do the calculation between the cost of creating the information assets that let you deliver that outcome and then the revenue that's generated as a result um, of that work. So at, at the moment, um, not, not automated inside Link, but the ability is there to be able to capture that content and then do analysis on it. Excellent. Thank you, Neil. Um, another question I have is around, uh, you know, typically just to look at one business process, what, what's kind of involved in that, Neil, to you know, get people moving along from a data capture, uh, just, to, just to get that first process moving? What, what would your, your sort of estimates and, and gut feel be around that in terms of time and activity? Oh, so from, from a time perspective, the, the, the process that we've seen that works most is a couple of half-day sessions with um, the... Yeah more senior leaders inside the organization. So maybe, you know, an afternoon and then a morning uh, where we begin to help them sketch out the, um, the base flow for the process that they're interested in. Um, so within that heart, within, you know, eight hours, we can end up modeling an end to end process inside the organization. And the reason we want to do it at a, um, a management level is we, we accept that there are a number of assumptions that management make about the work that gets done. Um, but by having that base flow in place, we also identify the subject matter experts that we need to go and talk to inside the organization. So we can limit the executive time impact um, and then we can go and focus on the people that actually do the work and really understand it or really manage it inside the organization and use those names to remove any assumptions that the management have included in the model, but also capture the detail that makes um, the digital twin so effective. So things like the cost of people and of systems. Um, the amount of time it takes to do the work, the value conversation is often better had at that subject matter expert level. Mm -hmm. So for a single process, you know, within, within um, 40 hours, 40 to 60 hours, we can end up having a, a current state built for a single process inside an organization fully attributed with cost and value. Um, and then we can begin to start building the narrative using uh, the insights from the twin to enable the conversation that we have uh, inside the, the business that then leads to that future state capture and the future state process is slightly different because we want the organization to be deeply involved in that and start to think um, innovatively and show the curiosity that's needed uh, in, in order to um, uh, build that that model that's then needed to take that conversation to the decision maker. Excellent. Thank you. And another question about, can you gather additional information about each part of your business, for example, risk? Oh, yes. Um, there's a couple of ways of doing this. So um, you can create any number of custom properties inside Link. So we can extend the data model um, to think about um, specific risk that occurs through the process. So we have a mechanism whereby we can um, use custom properties, but also tagging and flagging. So we might just flag things visually as um, areas for, for further investigation. But the other thing we can do is we can have risk as part of our whole value conversation. So um, we really want to move value away from just the financial value of information through to some of those more non-tangibles, uh, which we, we begin to have to think about. And, and that can include risk. So what's the risk if this content was not available inside the organization? Um, equally, there's a question about what's the risk if this if this content was exposed publicly. Um, you know, is there a competitive advantage that I have by protecting it? Uh, and that that allows us to to put risk into perspective, also against um, all of those other considerations about business value as well as the financial things. So there's there's several ways we can we can deal with risk through the model. Excellent. Okay, I think that's it for questions. Unless anybody else has got any other questions they'd like to pop in. Not seeing anything come up straight away. So, um, Neil, thanks so much. I think it's really informative. Definitely, uh, it's an area that I'm learning lots about. Um, we will be packaging up the deck 
and the recording itself and, and sort of within 24 hours we'll be sending out to all of the participants and those people that registered. If you do have any questions, um, you can ping Neil directly or myself on the email details below uh, and obviously you'll be getting notification from me on email as well so you can respond to those emails directly. Neil, thanks very much and, and thanks everybody for participating. Appreciate your time.